So the question I always grapple with is how can we get more doctors to use social media to connect with patients? How can we bring those red bars up? Well, one way is to offer doctors compelling reasons to do so. So today I'm going to share stories about various healthcare personalities, and hopefully that will give you some inspiration, some ideas on how you can incorporate social media in your professional life. I'm going to start with two compelling reasons. The first is providing physician context. Every day, there are new health stories that come out. Guidelines change. Medications are introduced. Drugs are recalled. There seems to be a new study that comes out every hour. And patients read this in a newspaper. They see it on television. And they really just want to know one question. They want to know, what does this mean to me? And unfortunately, with a lot of news reporting, it doesn't have enough physician commentary to give patients that type of meaning. They need context. So I think that's where social media comes in. A doctor can go on a blog, for instance, write a piece of commentary shortly after a piece has been published in a newspaper. They can go on Twitter and point his or her followers to appropriate physician commentary. I want to uh, take a look at cancer screening and use that as an example. Obviously, over the past few years, there's been significant controversy when it comes to breast cancer and prostate cancer screening. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force have modified their recommendations. And I get a lot of questions for this in my office. I'm 40 years old. Should I get a mammogram? I'm 65 years old. Should I get a PSA test? And it just so happens, I read a few days ago, and a perspective piece that really hits home. I just want to read you a short quote from that. This is from Michael Stefanik at Indiana University. And he wrote a perspective piece in the December 20th issue of the journal, the National Cancer Institute. And he says, there will come a time when all the patients have been followed, all the analyses done, all the groups assembled, and all the editorials written. And we still will not be secure in our knowledge of the individual harms and benefits of cancer screening. It appears that this time has come. Now, if the medical profession is still not secure about the role, about the knowledge behind cancer screening, how can we expect our patients to be? So what I try to do on my blog, I write pieces as well. I invite guest physicians to write and give their opinion as well. And we talk about some of the more nuanced issues that sometimes isn't reported in mainstream media. The concept of number needed to treat. The implications of false positive tests. Because in order for patients to make an informed decision when it comes to cancer screening, they're going to need to know this information. So I think social media is a powerful way to give context and meaning to the stories patients read in the newspaper and, they see, and the stories they see on television. Let me give a second reason. Dispel myths. I said earlier there's a lot of bad information out there. Well, there's a lot of information that's dangerous as well. And let's take a look at vaccines and autism. Despite the wealth of evidence that showed that there's no connection between the two, patients are still confused. There was a study a couple years ago, and they asked the country, do vaccines cause autism? 52% of respondents said definitely no. But if you think about that, that means almost half of the country wasn't sure. Why is this happening? One reason is that those who push an anti-vaccine agenda have utilized the online media much more effectively than health professionals. You go to sites like the Huffington Post, and you're going to have articles by celebrities that are medically and factually inaccurate. Yet, they have tremendous influence. Millions of people read the Huffington Post. And politicians, they can say whatever they want on the stump, like saying the HPV vaccine is dangerous, when in fact it isn't. And yet, every time this happens, the media picks up on this and causes a proverbial vaccine uproar. And every time there's a vaccine uproar, 
It's been shown that vaccination rates drop for three years afterwards. Paul Offit, he's a physician who speaks out against the anti-vaccine movement. He says it's much harder to unscare people than it is to scare them. So celebrities, politicians, they have the easy job. They can say whatever they want online and plant that seed of doubt in our patients' minds. And it's up to us health professionals, physicians, to pick up those pieces in the exam room and unscare our patients. That's why it's absolutely imperative that we cannot lose the PR battle online. If doctors lose our influence online, we risk losing our standing as healthcare authorities. So today, I want to give three ways where we can take back that online medium. Blogs, Twitter, and Facebook. So I've come a long way since that conversation with my brother-in-law back in 2004. My site gets about 7 million page views every year, which means about 15 to 20,000 of my stories are read every day. And someone wrote that a comment stream on one of my posts provides more insight on the realities of healthcare than any piece of journalism can ever hope to impart. And that encapsulates one of my primary goals. I want to pull that curtain back and let the public see some of the difficulties that physicians face when you try to practice medicine. The paperwork, the bureaucracy, the time pressures. Because let's face it, when it comes to issues that are important to doctors, we can use more influence on our politicians. And what better way to get to them than through their constituents, our patients. That's why it's imperative that we let our patients know that the more difficult it is for us to practice medicine, the harder it is to give patients the care they deserve. So how can we use social media to influence the health care debate? Let me give an example. A couple years ago, CBS Evening News did a piece on defensive medicine. I want to show you a short clip from that. Defensive medicine is pervasive and very expensive. It adds billions of dollars to the cost of health care every year. Defensive medicine is indeed bad medicine. Dr. Kevin Poe runs the popular medical blog, Kevin MD, where doctors routinely confess exactly how they run up costs by practicing defensive medicine. In this post, one ER doctor says he's just admitted two patients to the hospital when he was sure neither was having cardiac problems, but what am I to do? Another admits that in his practice, every patient with a headache gets a CAT scan. It's much easier to defend the fact that you ordered a test. So out of any doctor they could have chosen in the country, they chose a relatively anonymous, private practice, primary care doctor in southern New Hampshire. <laughs> but I had something a lot of other doctors didn't, which is a well-read blog. And that blog provided a platform for frontline health professionals, the common physician, if you will, and it gave them a voice. And in this case, that voice was elevated to a national media platform. Now, I talk a lot about social media to doctors across the country. And inevitably, the topic of health care reform comes up. And when I look into their eyes, there's a certain sense of helplessness, sometimes despair. In fact, I remember one doctor telling me, I know the way we're going to practice medicine is going to change, but I feel I don't have a say in the process. I'm not being heard. And I was thinking to myself, that's a shame. Because there is one group who does want to hear from us when it comes to health policy, and that's our patients. A Gallup survey a couple of years ago polled the country and asked them, who do you trust the most when it comes to health policy? The president, Congress, health policy experts, or doctors? Guess who came first? Exactly. It was doctors. People still trust us, and they want to hear what we have to say. That's why I advise physicians, no matter where they stand on the political spectrum, to speak out about health care reform. We need our voices heard if we're going to have a say in the process. 
So having a say, social media only takes you so far. You need to connect with mainstream media. You need to get on television. Go on live radio. Write op-eds for the newspaper. I have the fortunate opportunity of having a regular column in USA Today. And I use that national platform to talk about issues I think needs to be better articulated in a national health care conversation. I've written about the lack of primary care doctors, which will be especially relevant in 2014 when 33 million newly insured patients are going to be looking for health providers. I've talked about the fact that our emergency rooms are growing more crowded by the day and that doctors and nurses are getting burnt out from their job. And you know what? If I can do it, so can everybody in this room. I didn't have any media training in medical school or residency. I didn't even work for my school paper. But you know what I realized? I realized that whatever I did in social media since 2004 gave me some of the media skills necessary to connect with mainstream media. I wrote blog pieces giving commentary on what I thought was wrong with our health system. And that gave me the confidence and polished my writing skills so now I can submit op-eds to newspapers. I did live, I did online podcasts, which gave me some of the skills for my first live radio interview. And what better way is there to prepare for your television experience than doing patient education videos on YouTube? I have social media to thank for preparing me and giving me the opportunities to engage with mainstream media. And media skills are going to be critical for every physician if we're going to have a say in our changing health system around us. Social media gives us transparency. Not only does the public need to hear from doctors, we need to hear from patients as well. I read a lot of patient blogs, a lot of patients comment on my own blog. And there's frustration that you hear in their voices. Because no matter how bad we have it, patients have it worse. They're also dealing with paperwork, bureaucracy, as well as the rising cost of health insurance and the fact that drugs are becoming more expensive by the day. And you hear that frustration in their voices when I read some of the comments on my blog. They're frustrated that they have to wait weeks or months for an appointment or that they never hear back from the doctor's office after going through a test. One of the more recent complaints I hear is that doctors are too busy looking at their laptops and computer screens, typing in their EMRs instead of looking at the patient. So one of the things that I try to do is listen to that feedback on social media channels, and I've changed the way I've practiced. I offer same-day appointments. I make sure patients get back the raw data of whatever test they get. I don't even bring a laptop in a room anymore because I want to spend my time looking at the patient. Listening to that feedback on social media, honestly, has helped me become a better doctor. So I get a lot of questions from physicians about whether there are any rules they should follow. Well, both the Massachusetts Medical Society and the American Medical Association have come out with social media guidelines. Patient privacy always comes first. HIPAA should be the minimum standard, and we should aim above that. It's very easy to disclose patient information on social networks. We need to remain professional online and realize that how we act on the web should be no less professional than how we act when we're in the room face-to-face -face with the patient. I have what's called an elevator test, and this is what it is. If you say aloud what you write in a social network in a crowded hospital elevator, Ask yourself, is that okay? And if the answer is no, or even if you aren't sure, don't hit enter. Because you're going to be shocked at how fast things can spread online and how quickly you could potentially get into trouble. So I've spent the last 40 minutes or so talking about the intersection between healthcare and social media, and I want to give a few take home points. And the first one is this. What you post on the web is written in ink. What does that mean? It means whatever you post on a social network will get indexed by a search engine like Google. And once that happens, it could always be looked up in the archives, even after you delete the post. So 
So again, think before you hit enter, because once you do, it's going to be tattooed on the web. But you can use that permanency to your advantage and build what's called your digital footprint. A digital footprint is all the online information that's associated with your name. It could be a media interview that you've done, something you've said on television or in a newspaper, but it could also be your social network profile. And that's important because not only are patients going online and getting and reading health information, information on diagnosis and treatment, they're also looking you up. Gone are the days where you're going to look up doctors in the yellow pages. You're going to start on a page like this instead. And when they type in your name, it's really to every physician's benefit to be in control of what comes up when they hit enter on a Google page. And I say this with all seriousness. Everybody in this room should Google their names at least once a week. So let's say someone Googles my name. What comes up? My blog. But so my social media presence on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. But what if I wasn't engaged with social media? What if I didn't have that conversation with my brother-in-law? What then? Well, probably for a lot of doctors, it would be a third-party physician rating site. And the problem with these sites is that they're completely based on subjective patient reviews. The information can be inaccurate. And most importantly, you don't control that information that goes in there. So the most compelling reason why doctors should be involved with social media is because it puts them in control of their digital footprint. Use social media to manage your online reputation. Now, I get a lot of questions about these physician rating sites. The most common one is, how do I get rid of a negative review? The short answer is that you can't. And I'll tell you a few things not to do. Don't sue. Don't sue these sites. Don't sue the patients who write the negative review. It's been done before. These cases have been dismissed. And the negative firestorm of publicity is far worse than the negative review itself. So I'm going to give two suggestions. The first, counterintuitively, is to ask more patients to rate you, good or bad. Because there was a study that looked at these online physician rating sites. And they found that close to 90% of physician reviews are, in fact, positive. So if you ask your patients as a whole to review you, chances are those reviews will be better than you think and will drown out any outlier negative reviews. And the second way to combat this is to get involved with social media. Because any page that you put in your own name, whether it's a Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google profile, it will get ranked high on a search engine result page when your name is Googled and probably push down any of these third-party physician rating sites. And when I say get involved with social media, you obviously don't have to use it to the extent I do. I always advise doctors to tiptoe in and do what you're comfortable with. And for many, it could just be a simple page on LinkedIn, for instance, a static page. Type in a few lines of your resume. Talk a little bit about your practice, and then that's it. That simple act will put you ahead of 90% of your peers. And that page will get, again, ranked high when someone Googles you. And then if you decide to go forward, maybe then you can go on Twitter, share a few interesting medical links. Maybe start a blog. Go on Facebook. If you go down the path where you feel comfortable contributing to the web, you're going to realize how powerful that is in spreading the news. I talked earlier about the importance of dispelling myths. Well, there are about 70,000 pediatricians in this country. And Brian Vardabedian, who is a pediatric gastroenterologist in Texas, he says, if every one of those pediatricians wrote one blog post a year talking about vaccines and autism, just think about how that flood of reputable health information will drown out the online presence of a vocal anti-vaccine minority. The American Heart Association. They wanted to push chest-only CPR. But they didn't do a television spot or a radio commercial or take out a big newspaper ad. They did a YouTube video. They hired Ken Jong, family physician, but also comedian actor, and did this video on YouTube, and in the span of a few weeks, 
400,000 views. Social media is tremendously powerful in spreading your message.